Hey all, how's it going? So in the last few videos, we've gone over the sample distribution of sample means and the sample distribution of sample proportions. And now we're gonna put it all together and calculate some probabilities. So let's go to our notes. So just a quick recap about sample means and sample proportions is we established in the last few videos that these things come from bell curves. So if we were to draw our distribution of x bar, our sample mean, no matter what underlying variable that comes from, whether it be dice, um, total COVID cases across countries, um, incomes in a country, costs across businesses, once we start taking sample means, those come from a bell curve. And often this is a normal distribution, which we'll talk about in a second. This thing is centered at mu because the expected value of x bar equals mu, which is the true population mean. We similarly talked about the fact that distributions of sample proportions, p bar, come from bell curves. And those guys are centered also at the truth, p, so expected value of p bar equals p. And just a reminder, the reason that we're drawing distributions for sample means and sample proportions here are that we have to remember that sample means are random variables. Because every time we take a sample, we can take that sample of numbers and calculate a sample mean. But if we took a different random sample, we would get a different sample mean. If we took a third random sample, we'd get a different sample mean. If we did that enough times, and sort of drew a histogram of all of our different sample means, we'd get a lot of sample means in this region near the truth, the true mean, but we'd still get some extreme sample means. We'd get some weird samples. It's kind of like every once in a while in poker, somebody gets a royal flush. Every once in a while, somebody does actually roll six um, sixes in a row on die or six ones in a row. Although that's really rare, it does happen sometimes, so it does have a positive probability of occurring, right? Similarly, if we took a bunch of different samples and calculated proportions, like if we polled a different bunch of different people about President Trump's approval rating, we'd get a lot of different sample proportions close to the true, sam the true population proportion but we'd also get some extreme values. So we always wanna be asking ourselves, what's the probability sort of getting extreme values relative to getting close to the truth? We wanna be in here, right? Generally, the goal is to get close to the truth. So we like to be kind of in this region around the center, but there's always the possibility of extreme values. And so once we know the distribution of variables like sample means and sample proportions, we can actually start calculating probabilities. And that's really when the power of statistics comes into play. So let's talk a little bit about what we call normalizing sample means or sample proportions using Z statistics or Z scores. So once we have our sample mean that we know comes from a bell curve like this, and it's centered at the truth, right? So I'm just redrawing what we had up there, mu. And suppose I get, or suppose I'm interested in asking something like, what's the probability that I get an X bar in this region. So that would be an X bar below the truth. And maybe that's like, hey, what if I'm working at a company and I know that this is the true mean, 
but I know that a regulator is going to come test a sample of my um, widgets. And if that sample mean of widget sizes lands over here, I'm going to get in trouble. Like I'm going to get a fine by some regulator. Well, I want to know what the probability of me getting that fine is. So what we can do is called normalizing. And you've probably seen this in the past in your last class where we calculate what's called a z-score, which we'll just call z. And the way to do that is to take, so this is the x-bar I'm interested in. What's the probability of landing to the left of that x-bar? And the first step in calculating that probability is gonna be taking x-bar and subtracting mu. Remember that the expected value of x-bar minus mu, or sorry, equals mu. So if we think about it, the expected value of x bar minus mu is gonna be equal to zero. So we expect on average to get a z equal to zero. Now, the other thing we do in this normalization process is we divide by the standard error of x bar. So remember the standard error of x bar equals sigma, the underlying standard deviation of the sample, divided by the square root of n. So another way to write z would be x bar minus mu over sigma divided by the square root of n. And it's nice to remember to put parentheses in here because when we calculate this stuff on calculators, or in Excel, we're gonna to wanna to remember those parentheses. And notice, let's think about what we've done here. Basically, we have taken what was the distribution of all of the different X bars, and we're asking about this one right here, and we've changed it to a different type of distribution. Now, our z distribution right here is not going to be centered at mu because we subtracted mu for our z score right here, right? We subtracted mu and the expected value of z is going to be zero because the expected value of our sample mean minus the truth is zero. So the top, the numerator of this fraction recenters the distribution at zero. Also, when I look at, say, the number 1 or the number negative 1 here, this region represents being within one standard error of the true mean. So what we do is we recenter at 0, and then we... Can we change by dividing by the standard error. We change the axis, and now it's not measured in terms of x bars, so it's not measured in um, widget inches, like if we were doing the widget example. Now we've taken widget inches, which the top of this denominator is measured in, and we have turned it into the currency of statistics, which standard errors are the currency of statistics. So the axis on a z represents how far away is the sample mean from the true mean measured in standard errors? So again, when we go from an underlying x bar value to a z value, we're just really doing a conversion to how far is x bar from the true mean measured in standard errors. And that will always work no matter what the underlying distribution or whatever the underlying variable is, whether it's inches, dollars, die, number on cards. Once we take sample means, we get bell curves and we can get a z-score. And all the z-score is doing is taking the difference between our sample mean, the true population mean, and changing it so that it's measured in standard errors. So you should always try to remember that. Let's try to give ourselves some more room here because we also want to talk about proportions.
because we can do the same thing for the proportions. This is the z if we have a sample mean. If we were doing a sample proportion, the idea is the same. We take z equals p bar minus p divided by s e p bar, and we remember that s e p bar equals the square root of p one minus p, where p is the population proportion here, and we divide that by n. So it's basically exactly the same formula. We just have to remember that when we're dealing with proportions, we have a different formula for the standard error underlying the proportion, okay? And the same thing, this turns a proportion into a z, and all of the logic is the same. Now, up here we said the reason we're doing this is we want to figure out a probability. Well, some really nice, smart people made a bunch of tables that once you have a z-score, that z-score can be converted into a probability. You probably used tables to do that in the past in your other classes. I'll kind of show what one of those tables looks like, but I'm going to encourage you in the future to always use Excel to do those things, because as I've mentioned in the past, we're going to try to be using Excel, which is how we'd really do this in the real world anyway. Now there's one special thing about, there's a special case we have to deal with here. And sometimes, so notice that I used sigma up here in this formula. Well, oftentimes, especially in the future, this is gonna come up more in the future, we don't know what sigma is. So what if, we don't know sigma. Well, then we estimate sigma. The answer is to estimate sigma, the population standard deviation, using S, the sample standard deviation. And if we're in this case, something actually, we have to make a little bit of a change. In this case, we don't, we can't do z-scores anymore because we need to know the sample or the population standard deviation to do a z-score. So what we do is we calculate a t-statistic, which is basically exactly the same, except now we're gonna use s over the square root of n. And notice that this implies some additional uncertainty. So when we're calculating t, let's draw t and z on the same chart. So if this was our z distribution right here, then t is actually going to be a little bit more spread out than that because that spread Basically, the way you should think about how spread out these distributions are is reflecting the amount of uncertainty around the truth. So this is going to be mu here because that's the population mean. How much uncertainty do we have, uncertainty do we have when we're trying to get at mu? Well, if we are trying to use, if we also have to estimate the standard deviation using S, that's going to lead to more uncertainty and that's gonna cause us to be dealing with a wider distribution, okay? And as n increases the sample size, t is gonna get closer and closer to a z distribution. We'll talk about that more in the future, but I wanted to bring it up now. Um, in the next part of this video, I'll show you some of this stuff in Excel. So I'll see you guys in a minute. Hey guys, so I wanted to start off this next video by showing something you probably saw in your last class quite a bit. <clears throat> and so here I just found online a picture of a Z distribution. And what this tells us, so this is just like the Z distributions I was drawing in the first part of the video. So really you should imagine this is labeled Z. But one thing that's really special about Z distributions is that we can calculate probabilities under them. 
And this th thing that you've probably seen in the past says that 68% of observations in a Z distribution are between minus one and one. Well, what does that really mean? Well, if we remember from the last video that a Z distribution is how far away sample means are from population means, what this says is that 68% of a sample means should be within one standard error of the population mean. So if I take 100 samples and I calculate 100 different sample averages, 68 of those sample averages about should be within one standard error of the population mean. Now, 95% of sample means will be within two standard errors of the population mean. And 99.7% of the sample means will be within three standard errors. Now that's what this graph shows. But what we're going to do now is figure out a more, this is just for these three special cases, within one, within two, and within three. But we want to make this more flexible so we can deal with a wide variety of different cases. And for that in the past, you might have used a Z table that looks like this right here. So the first thing that I want you to remember about these Z tables is that they always give you the probability to the left. That's why this picture right here of a Z diagram has the area to the left shaded. So imagine I calculate my Z score and I find negative one. And then I look in this table for negative one. So I go down. Here's a negative one right here. This says that the probability of being to the left of negative one in a Z distribution is 15.87% or 0.1587. Now the columns just allow, allow you to get more specific. So say I get a Z score of negative 2.85. What's the probability of being to the left of negative 2.85. Well, so I go down to negative 2.8, 2.80, 2.81, 2.82, 4, 5. The probability of being to the left of 2.85 in a Z distribution is 0 0.022. Now, sometimes we care about, so that's also like saying the probability of being more than 2.85 standard errors below the population mean with the sample mean is only 0.22% or 0 0.0022. Sometimes we want to know the area to the right though. So what we have to remember is that all Z scores will be under this graph somewhere. So the probability of Z being under this curve is one. So if there is a, for example, 10% chance of being to the left of this Z, what must be the probability of being to the right? It must be 90% because 10% plus 90% equals 100%. So to get the area to the right, we take one minus the probability to the left because those two numbers always have to add to one, okay? So let's see how this works when we're dealing with some actual like questions you might observe in the homework. So to do these types of calculations, we need to have a population mean. Most of this class will assume that we do not know the population mean. So a lot of this is getting you used to understanding Z distributions and later on T. T distributions, by the way, work in a very similar way. They're just a little bit wider, as I talked about in the last video. So let's suppose we're given a homework problem where they tell us the population mean of some variable is 15. Maybe this is the number of customers who walk into Starbucks per hour. On average, 15 customers walk in to Starbucks per hour. But there's a population standard deviation of five. Okay, so that varies on average by five. Well, now we can ask some probability questions because we understand z-scores. 
what is the probability that a sample mean of a sample size of size 30 will be less than 15? Where so imagine that z actually you don't have to imagine it, I'll show it to you. Right here, the population mean is going to be 30, so that's going to be the middle. Or sorry, the population mean is 15, so that's going to be right in the middle. So a sample mean being less than 15. So I think that it should just be 50%, right? Because it's saying, what's the probability that the sample mean will be less than the population mean? And if the population mean is right in the middle of the distribution, then being less than it is half of the distribution, so it should probably be 50%, right? Well, let's check it out. So first, let's calculate our z. So z from our formula equals the, pop, the sample mean we're interested in is less than 15. That's going to be our cutoff for x bar. So 15, that's x bar, minus the population mean right here. I can click on that. That's going to be 0, right? because 15 minus 15 is 0. Now I really don't even have to divide because 0 divided by anything is 0, but let's just do it anyway to get the whole formula. Divided by, more parentheses, sigma is 5 right here, divided by the square root of n, which is 30. And that should be 0. It is 0. So now we could go to our z table right here and say, okay, find z equals 0. Oh, it is 50%. That's what the table says. But I want you guys to get used to using Excel. So there's a nice Excel formula that basically is a built-in table. And this is a really more powerful way to do it than trying to use those tables, because every time you'll have to go to the table, look through the column in the row to find your number. When you could in Excel, so let's type probability. So this is going to be, and this formula also always gives you the area to the left. Now we're asking about an area to the left in this problem, less than. Less than means to the left of on a number line, right? So we don't have to worry about that in this case, but we will later on. So equals norm.dist. That means normal distribution which is the type of distribution a z distribution is. A z is a special case. z is a standard normal distribution. We call it a standard normal distribution because it has an expected value of 0, and the standard deviation is 1. So that's a special normal distribution, but it is a case. So x, for us, is our z-score. Nice and confusing for you there, because we're going to use the standard normal distribution here. So we're asking, what is the probability to the left of 0, which is this z I just calculated? The standard deviation of a standard normal distribution is 1. So you kind of have to remember, we're not putting in the standard deviation from up there that we calculated, or the standard error, I should say. Oops, the mean is also 0. They want that first, and that's the mean of the standard normal distribution. So 0 is the number we're putting in. That's our z-score. 0 is also the mean of the standard normal distribution. That's what we're taking our draw from. The standard deviation is 1, because we're dealing with a standard normal distribution, a z-distribution. Cumulative, yes, we want true. You're always going to write true here. It means that we want the area to the left. And what do we get? We got 0.5, 50%. That's the same number that the table told us because it's doing the same thing. Now I want to show you real quick that Excel with this normal distribution will actually do the z-score for you. But the old school way to do it is to calculate the z-score and then put the z-score in the table because you had to use the table before. But because Excel is more powerful than that, we could also write norm.dist. X is, we could just stick the sample mean in here, 15. What's the probability of being to the left of 15? In a normal distribution, with 
a population mean, a mean of 15. And a standard deviation of 5, but because I'm asking about a sample mean, we can't just put in 5 because the standard deviation of the sample mean is the standard error. And I have to divide this by the square root of 30 because that's how we get the standard deviation of sample means. And we want true again. And I got 0.5 again. Still works. So let's try a more realistic problem because I want you to notice that in this question, you should kind of realize that you should get 50% no matter what in that case. So what is the probability that a sample mean from a sample of size 30 will be less than 14? This is a little bit more interesting because this isn't a clear answer. So z equals, open parentheses, 14, that's the x bar I'm interested in, the probability to the left of that, minus 15 divided by 5 sigma divided by the square root of 30. That's the standard error of x bar, right? That I'm dividing by. Now my z score is minus 0 1.095. So the probability in this case will be equal to norm dot dist. So this is just the Excel's version of going to that table and looking. We could look real quick. Minus 1.0 Actually, minus 1.10 is what that'll round to. So minus 1.10, 1357. So we should get something pretty close to that. The table is rounding, and we don't have to round with Excel, which is kind of nice, right? That's another reason to use Excel. You'll get a more accurate answer by not having to round. So normal distribution. This right here is the x I want, but the z-score. What's the area to the left of that? The mean for a standard normal distribution is 0. The standard deviation for a standard normal, standard normal distribution is 1. And true. 0.1366. Now, the reason that that is a little bit different than this one is because we got a more accurate answer by not having to round our z-score right here. Okay? We could also do it the other way by not even converting, because Excel basically is doing that whole process for you when you say norm.dist. Let's just stick in the number. The probability of being to the left to the 14, left of 14, in a distribution centered at this population mean right here. Standard deviation of the sample mean is 5 divided by square root 30, comma, true. Sweet. We got the same number as we should. So you don't actually have to calculate the z-scores in Excel. You can jump through the process and just plug everything in, all of the underlying data. And now the homework might ask you for the z-score. So it depends on the homework question. So those ones both ask for probabilities less than. But we have to be careful with this one. What's the probability that the sample mean of a sample size of 30 will be greater than 16? So the probability of being 1 below 15, 14, was 0 0.136668. What's the probability of being greater than 16, 1 above the population mean? I'm going to go ahead and guess that that's also going to be 0 0.136668. Because another special characteristic of those bell curves is that they're symmetric. That bell curve, where this centered at 15 of sample means, is symmetric. It's like mirror images. So the probability of being less than one below should actually be the same as the probability of being greater than one above. 16 is 1 above 15, 14 is 1 below 15. But let's make sure. Z equals 16 minus 15 divided by 5 divided by, oops, I want parentheses, 5 divided by SQRT 30. Sigma divided by the square root of the sample size. 
Well, look at that. I just got the positive version of that z-score, right? Makes sense. If it doesn't make sense, write it down and think about it. So now let's figure out the probability of that. That equals norm dot dist. The probability, but remember, this is going to give me the probability to the left. This is where we have to remember that. So let's fix that in a second. Because this is not going to give us the right answer. 0, 1, because those are the parameters of the z distribution. Expected value is 0, standard deviation is 1, comma, true. But this is going to be the wrong answer, because that's the probability of being to the left of 16. How can I fix this? Go in my formula and do 1 minus. Because if I have the probability to the left, that plus the probability to the right have to equal 1, because it all has to add to 1. And so if I want to get that probability to the right, I can just do 1 minus this. And I get 0 0.136608, which is this number again. So we were right about the symmetry, right? So let's try it the other way. Probability equals norm dot dist. Oops, I'm going to remember to do my 1 minus first this time. The x I'm looking for now is 16. That's my x bar that I'm interested in. From a distribution that's centered at 15, that's the population mean, comma, 5 divided by sqrt 30, because that is the standard deviation of sample means, sigma divided by the square root of n, comma, true. Boom. Got it. Sweet. That's always scary. What if I got the wrong number? Then you wouldn't believe me anymore. Let's try a proportion one. What is the probability that a sample proportion from a sample size of size 30 will be between, this is new, 0.44 and 0.47? Well, now we need to do two z scores. Z1 equals 0.44 minus 0.45. That's the z-score for this number. That's the population proportion right there, 0.45, divided by sqrt, 0.45, times 1 minus 0.45, divided by 30. That's that standard error formula for a population proportion, right? Or for a sample proportion. And in this case, I know the population proportion, so I can just use that. So let's hit enter there. That's our Z1. We're only 0.11 Z standard errors below 0.45 with this 0.44. Let's do Z2 because now we have to deal with this 0.47, right? So Z2 is going to equal 0.47. 47 minus 0.45 divided by sqrt 0.45 times 1 minus 0.45 divided by 30, which is n. And those are all in the square root. So that's 0.22 standard errors above. So I want the area between. If I kick for this probability right here, so this is going to be probability two. Let's do this one first. That's going to give me the whole area to the left of 0.47. So this is going to be norm dot dist. And we'll just do the z version this time. This is the number I need to be to the left of. 0, 1, true. This is the probability of being to the left of this number. Notice it makes sense that that's just a little bit more than 50%. Because if it was 0, we'd get 50%. Point two two is a little bit above 0. 
So it's going to be a little bit above 50% to the left of that. Well, probability, probability, probability one equals norm dot dist. This is our x. 0, 1, because we're dealing with a standard normal distribution. 0.45. Does it make sense that that's a little bit less than 50%? Yeah, because I'm a little bit to the left of 0. So think about why those things make sense relative to 50%. That's a good way to check answers. Like, it's, does this make sense, this probability? So this is the area to the left of 0.47. This is the area to the left of 0.44. How do I find the probability between? Well, if I take all of the area to the left of 0.47, so equals this, that's all the area to the left of 0.47. But this number has too much in it. That's all to the left of 0.11. If I subtract that number, I'll just be left with the area between. So we have a distribution. We got all of the area to the left of 0.47, but that's too much because that's everything from 0 to 0.47. I only want 0.44 to 0.47, so I need to subtract the area to the left of 0.44, and that's what those two numbers represent. So what's the area between, what's the probability that a sample proportion of, from a sample of size 30 will be between these two numbers, given that this is the population proportion? About 13.1%. And so we did four different types. We did three different types. We did, what's the probability of being less than? That's the simplest case, because that calculation or the table always just gives you the area to the left, less than. But then we had to do greater than, and when we did greater than, we had to do one minus to get our probability. Then we did between. Between, we take the bigger one and subtract the smaller one. And you could like draw that, shade the region, and that would kind of help. That usually helps calculate those things. And we probably will hit that in some more videos later on. But let me know if you have any questions about this stuff. It's not necessarily easy, but I hope this video makes it a little bit easier on you. All right, see you later.